Hello Year 11s, this is a small video in which I'm going to just explain the key terms and a few tips uh, for the key terms that generally pops up uh, in relation to the experimental questions. Uh, so I'll be just going through what generally that each term means and if such a question comes in the exam, what should you be uh, looking for? So let's move on to the terms. So there are some key words that always comes up. One of them generally comes up every year uh, together with an experiment based question. So I have picked the main ones from the key terms that has popped up in the exam so far. You can see there are 12 of them. Uh, and in the next couple of slides, I'm going to go through each one of them. So let's start with a very common word. Most of you would already be knowing what this is about. So it is accuracy. So say you had to do an experiment to find the value of acceleration due to gravity. So uh, and the value is 9.81. Say you did the experiment and you got the value of 9.79. So that is very close to 9.8, isn't it? So your answer is accurate. The accuracy is how close the values are to the true value. Generally, they don't ask you to define accuracy. They will give you an experiment and they will ask you, how will you make sure that your experiment is accurate? So you should be saying that I will repeat the experiment and then find the mean. Now, why do we find the mean? This reduces the effect of random errors. We will be dealing with random errors later on. And then sometimes what happens is uh, they give you uh, a data, a table of results, and then they ask you to find what is wrong in the results. So you need, uh, when you get a table of results like that, the first thing you need to check is all the columns to the same number of decimal places. Okay. If you're finding the mean of, say, two or three numbers, the mean should always have the same number of decimal places as the measured value. Most of the time, that is one place they try to trick you. They will give the uh, mean of 11, 12, and 11 as uh, 11.54, something like that. So ideally, it might be correct when you do the calculations. But since there was no decimal values for 11, etc., when you find their mean, the mean should also not have any decimal values. So the number of decimal value, if the numbers have are to one decimal place, then the mean should also be to the uh, be to one decimal place. Then we are moving on to the next one, which is anomaly. Again, that is a very familiar term. You will know that anomaly is uh, a data that does not fit into the pattern. It is an outlier. So since it doesn't fit into the pattern, we generally tend to ignore it. So you have three set of readings where you have to find the mean, say 10, 56, and 11. So you can clearly see that 56 does not uh, fit into the pattern. So when you find the mean, you will find, you will just exclude 56 or you will always exclude the anomaly to calculate the mean. It is always discarded. Now, also, when you did an experiment first time, you got a measured value as 11. The next time you're getting it as 56. So you don't know which one is an anomaly, isn't it? So you have to always, whenever there is an anomaly, or whenever you see that the two repeats don't match, you should always uh, repeat it once more so that you can see which one will match with the other two readings. Then a very popular term they ask you is, how do you know that an experiment is reproducible? So there are two key words, reproducible and repeatable. Reproducible is when another person or another group does the same experiment, same experiment in the sense uh, they are testing the same thing, but they might use a different method to do that and uh, they might use, be using different equipments. So 
even when they use different methods or equipment, they end up getting the similar, say, end up getting similar results. That is what reproducible is. Then comes repeatable. So it is very similar to reproducible. The only difference is it is not another person or group that repeats the experiment. The same person or the same group repeats the experiment, the same method under the same conditions and they get similar results. That is when you say an experiment is repeatable. Usually what we do in the class, it comes under the category of repeatable because we repeat the experiment. We'll be using the same method. We'll be using the same operators given to us so that what we do in the lab in the class is repeatable. Reproducible is when say someone in the other part of the world is going is try, testing the same hypothesis that we said. Uh, that is what reproducible is. Reliable, we don't see that word too often now. Uh, before, before reproducible and repeatable became popular, we used to use the word reliable. We used to say, if you repeat an experiment and you get the same results, you call it reliable. So that was quite a general term. So they then have changed it into reproducible and repeatable. So basically, if an experiment is reliable, it, uh, the same person doing the method and again and again should end up getting similar results. Also, somebody else doing the experiment with uh, different equipments or under different conditions should also end up getting the same results. Okay, so reproducible is when another person or another group does the experiment and they end up getting similar results. They might use different method. They might use different equipments. Repeatable is when the same person or the same group repeats the experiment using the same method and equipments and they get similar results. The next word is precision. So precision again is a really important term. It is how so when you're doing the repeats, how close are the repeats with each other? So I, I said, did the I found the value of, say, I found the time it's, uh, the, it takes for the trolley to come down the ramp. The first time I did, I got time as, say, 6.5 seconds. The second time I did, I got 6.4 seconds. The third time I did, I got 6.5 again. So you can see that the measurements are very close to each other then they are precise normally if they give you an experiment and they ask you how can you make the experiment more precise check what type of measuring instruments we are using there if they are using an analog thermometer say to go for a digital thermometer if they are using an analog ammeter or voltmeter go then say I will be going for a digital ammeter or a voltmeter. Generally, digital instruments are much more precise than analog instruments. Okay, then by looking at the reading also, you can say which one is more precise. So I'm using a meter rule. I'm measuring the distance as 70 meters. Then using the same meter rule, I can see that I can measure up to 70 point say 14 meter if I can measure it that way then that tells me that 70.14 because that is giving me more information isn't it so that 70.14 meters is more precise than 70 meters more the decimal places means I'm going into more details so that makes it more precise and if I remember, one exam question was what I said before, sort of giving you a data of results. And in that, they asked which row of uh, data is the most precise one. So if you have a set of repeats which are in close agreement with each other, like I said, 11.4, 11.5, 11.3, 11 they are all in close agreement with each other. So that is, they are the most precise 
resolution is basically the smallest reading you can take with an instrument. You can easily find out the resolution of an instrument. You just need to look again. Uh, when you look at the value, you will understand, especially by looking at the decimal places. So I used a mass balance and measured a mass of an object. When I looked into the balance, it said 90.01 grams. In that case, 0 0.01 is its uh, resolution. And whenever we say resolutions, uh, we have to say the units very clearly. Instead of this, when I measured, say the mass balance showed me 40.6. So that is, so it showed me the value as 40.6 grams. So that zero, there's only one decimal place. So the resolution of that should be 0 0.1 grams. Using the thermometer when I'm measuring something, that not something, the measuring the temperature of something, say I can see that the temperature is 20.6 degrees Celsius. So that is again one decimal place. So the resolution of the thermometer is going to be 0 0.1 degree Celsius. Control variables you should be very familiar with. In every experiment, we actually change, most of the time what happens is we change one of the quantities and then we keep uh, most of the other quantities the same. Because we change this one quantity, the quantity that we change, we call them independent variable. Because of that, something changes. You call that dependent variable. But everything else you try to keep the same. For example, I'm checking how does the surface area of an object affect the heat transfer. So I will have, say, three different objects with me. And they will have three. I mean, I will have three. Uh, it's just one object, but I will have it with in three different surface area to see how it affects the rate of heat transfer. I will try to keep the object to be made of the same uh, material. All those things I will keep the same because if they change again, I can't have uh, one material made of wood and one material made of metal and then again have different surface area because I would not be able to say uh, which factor has actually affected it. So uh, control variables are the quantities that are kept constant throughout in an experiment. In every experiment, you will be able to find loads of uh, control variables. For example, I'm checking how color affects the heat rate of heat transfer. We have studied that black is a very good absorber. White is a very good reflector. To study that, I'm doing an experiment. I have a beaker which is black in color. I have a beaker that is uh, white in color. Both have hot water in it. So I need to make sure that it is the same size of the beaker there. So that is a control variable. I just need to make sure that uh, the surface area of the beakers are the same. So like that, every experiment, we have to keep something the same throughout. And that is what you call the control variables. Range. Range is related to the precession we did before. So range is basically, I did an experiment, I repeated an experiment five times. So I have five different values as my repeats. So I go pick the highest number from the repeats, go for the lowest number from the repeat and find the difference between them. So less the difference between the repeats, we generally say it is more precise or less the range, more precise it is. Because if I say I had 9.8, 9.7, 9.8, 9 the difference between them is only 0 0.1, right? But if I had say 9.8, 7.8, and then 4.8, so uh, largest is 9.8, smallest is 4.8, difference is 5. That is a really big difference. So that tells us that it is not precise at all. Then uh, there are two common types of errors that you come across in these experiments. One of them is called the random error. So the random error is something, it is unpredictable. You can't say that this time I had a random error of two. So next time I'm going to have a random error of four. 
we can't say anything like that. It usually happens uh, when you're starting and stopping a stopwatch. So your reaction time comes into it. That affects it. Then uh, parallax error. So whenever you're taking the reading from a measuring cylinder or from a ruler, you have to always look at it at eye level. If you look at a particular angle, the reading changes. And the problem with that is each time you will not be looking at the same angle. You might be looking in a different way each time. So the best thing is always look at the, uh, look at the readings at your eye levels. You might have to bend down a bit sometimes to take these readings. That's absolutely fine. Then systematic error. And that's, I think, that is the last one in our list. Systematic error is something that happens with the, by the same amount every time. For example, I switched on an ammeter. I can see that it already shows a reading of 2 amps. So instead of showing 0, it is showing a reading of 2 amps. So when I do the connections and when I get, say, 10 amps, it's not actually 10 amps, isn't it? it already had a 2 amps in it, then it is showing 10 amps, so the actual current is only 8 amps. But with that uh, ammeter, any current measurement that I take, all of them are going to sh show that difference of 2 amps. So the same amount of error repeats each time. And whenever we switch on uh, a measuring instrument and if it doesn't read 0 where it is supposed to read 0, we call that error a zero error. So zero error is a very common example for systematic error. And then sometimes what happens is whenever you take liquid in a measuring cylinder in a, uh, in a tube, the level is never parallel to the bottom. There's always a curve downwards. That is what you call meniscus. So actually, when you're taking the reading, you should be taking the reading from the bottom of the meniscus. Again, we might not do that always. We decide to take it from the top, maybe somewhere from the side. OK, so what that reading from the bottom of the meniscus, always the same error comes, whichever, what, whichever measurement we try to make with that. OK. So these were the few keywords that I wanted to tell you. Then, oh, I think there was one more, directly proportional. Directly proportional means you will see a straight line graph passing through 0, 0. So please keep in mind, whenever they give you a graph, which is a straight line starting from the origin, and they ask you what type of relation it is, Please don't say that when one increases, the other one increases and leave it there. If you say both are directly proportional, you get the whole two marks, which generally is for those type of questions. OK, to do with any electricity experiments, you need to say you are switching off the experiments whenever you are not doing the uh, experiment. To do with experiment that deals with weights, how to make it safe, Make sure you're standing uh, away from the setup and not standing so close that the weights might fall onto your legs. So wherever possible, see if you can bring in some aspect of safety into the answer. Otherwise, uh, make sure you have written the extra bits of accuracy, etc. wherever possible. Okay, so with that, I'm coming to the end of this video. I hope you found these four videos on PAGs useful and all the very best for your exams next week. See you.